welcome members and also viewers who may be watching proceedings on Oireachtas TV to the public session of the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Children and Youth Affairs. The purpose of today's meetings is to meet in session one with representatives of Women's Aid to discuss the organisation's impact report 2018, children let down by the system, and in session two, representatives, uh, representatives of the Children's Rights Alliance to discuss the organisation's report card 2019. Session one, and I would like to welcome on behalf of the committee uh, Ms Margaret Martin, Director of Women's Aid, and uh, Ms Ursula Regan, a Chair of the Board of Women's Aid. You're both very, well, very welcome. Um, before we commence, in accordance with procedure, I'm required to draw your, your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of the evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only uh, to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence in connection with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where, effect that where possible you should not criticise nor make charges against a person, persons or entity by name in, in a way to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise, nor make charges against the person inside the House or an official by name, or in a way to make him or her identifiable. May I please remind all of our witnesses and indeed our guests in the public gallery to please switch off your mobile phone or switch it to flight mode as it will interfere with the sound system if you fail to do so. I wish to advise you that any submission or opening statement that you've made to the committee will be published on the committee website after this meeting. After your presentation, there will be questions from the member of the members of the committee. And I now call on Ms Martin and Ms Regan to make your opening statements, please. Thank you. And thank you for inviting us here today to present on our impact report. Domestic violence and child abuse are often interlinked. Firstly, domestic violence and child abuse may co-occur with the perpetrator abusing his partner and also directly abusing the children. Secondly, it has been re recognised that exposing children to intimate partner abuse in itself is a form of emotional child abuse, with detrimental effects on the child's development and well-being. Last year, there were, were 19,089 contacts made to Women's Aid Direct Services, during which 16,994 disclosures of domestic violence were made about women, including physical, emotional, financial and sexual abuse. The kind of abuse women experienced includes being stalked, women and children being locked out of their homes overnight, being isolated from friends and family, and being in fear of their lives because abusers threatened them with guns, knives and injury due to speeding in cars. This included 898 threats by the abusive partner to kill the woman, the children, her family or to harm himself. We heard 3,816 disclosures of physical abuse, including women having their hair pulled, being beaten, being smothered and strangled and hospitalised. We also heard 141 disclosures of abuse while the woman was pregnant with a number of women experiencing miscarriage as a result. We also heard 526 disclosures of women being coerced into sexual activity, having intimate videos and photos taken and shared without their consent, including 226 disclosures of children being ra raped by their intimate partner, including during pregnancy or after childbirth. We heard 1,540 disclosures of financial abuse, women being denied access to the family income, having their own salaries or social welfare payments stolen or controlled by their abuser, being made to account for every penny spent, and often being left without money for basic family needs. Women were left with broken bones and teeth, bruising, head injuries and internal injuries. Some women experienced miscarriage as a result of the assaults and were experiencing post-traumatic stress, anxiety, depression and exhaustion. Many of the women who disclose the above tactics of, of abuse have children. In fact, 72% of the women who used our one-to-one -one services for the first time in 2018 had children. We know from European FRA report that children are often aware of the violence experienced by their mothers and therefore we can confidently assume that a number of children in Ireland are aware of their mothers being abused as described above, either because they see the abuse happening or they see the aftermath. They may be fearful for themselves, may want or try to intervene, may know their mother cannot protect them, may fear that she may be hurt or killed. We know that seeing or hearing or otherwise knowing about this abuse has a negative and a profound impact on children. 
In addition, we heard 3,728 disclosures of abuse of children in the context of domestic abuse, including children being physically, sexually and emotionally abused, as well as witnessing the abuse against their mothers. In 432 cases disclosed to our helpline, a social worker was involved. Despite the range and severity of the impact of domestic violence on children, they are often the forgotten victims with limited services and protection available. Women are, our children are impacted by the lack of vital services such as refuge, and in 2018 our 24-hour helpline made a total of 244-hour calls to refuge for women who could not make that call themselves. And on 126 occasions, which was 52%, the refuges were full. In many of these calls, children, women would have had children with them and safe accommodation for them was simply not available. They then had to return to the abuser or become homeless. Another huge gap is the lack of counselling services for children who have experienced domestic violence, either by being a witness to the violence against their mothers or being directly targeted. There are very few affordable and specialised services to assist children in their, their journey to recovery. Moreover, the consent of the abuser is needed for children to attend counselling and it is often denied in our experience. We have a number of detailed recommendations in our submission looking at research, guidelines, training, legal aid and the provision of supervised contact centres. The key principle binding these recommendations together is that there needs to be a recognition in law and in practice that the best practice the best, it's in the best interest of children to live free from domestic violence, including freedom from witnessing abuse against their mothers, and that any custody and access arrangements need to ensure this as a, a first priority. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Martin, Ms. Regan, um, for your presentation to us this morning. Um, some startling facts uh, that you've presented to the committee. I'd like to offer the committee to uh, Vice Chair Senator Freeman, please. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. That, it's horrifying listening to, to, to those facts. Um, and, and a lot of them, you know, I couldn't even absorb. Um, I, just two brief questions. Um, what, what services are? You said that there's little or no service available for children when they do witness violence in the home. Um, so what, what is there and, 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 and what needs to be done? And the second question is, and I know you're women's aid, and this is about women, but children also witness violence in the home when the female is the perpetrator. And I just want to know, do you have any information about that or do you come together, if there is an organisation that deals with that, do you come together again because of the child's sake? So, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of the services that are there, 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 in terms of refuge, there would very often be a support worker for, for the woman and then a support worker for children. So children will have a support worker working for them, with them while they are in refuge. The difficulty, as I already outlined, is that there's very often a shortage of space uh, and refuges are turning away uh, significantly more women and children that they are accommodating. The other I suppose the thing we hear most, and we have, we have had a, a recent consultation with women in terms of family law, but one of the things that came up as a very consistent concern from mothers was the lack of therapy and support for their children. Um, and where it is available, that it's costly and it's, it's very often that the, the therapist does not really understand the impact mm. of domestic mm. violence because it's a very particular situation um, and understanding the dynamics of domestic violence and the level of threat sometimes that women are struggling under is really important to understanding how to support that woman and her children. In terms of, obviously there will be children who are abused by their, their mothers, it's not something that the people come to us about. Uh, certainly most of our calls would come from women themselves um, and about 3% of our calls would be from, from, from men. Sometimes they are fathers um, directly, a lot of the time they would be supports to a woman, maybe a new partner, etc. Okay, so, so you don't know any figures of we don't. I mean, we, we would do, we have met with the Children's Rights Alliance, with Barnardo's, with um, one family. We would, we've actually met with them fairly recently to look for some sort of support to, on foot, I suppose, of, of if you think of the voice of the child and the Children and Family Relationships Act, 
to really to be able to bring that voice centre stage into court proceedings, that there would be some sort of research and consultation with children mm. and what is their experience. And I think something like that might bring some of the answers to the question you're asking. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Senator. Just, a, 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 just an observation on, on one of your closing remarks. You said the consent of the abuser is needed for the children to attend counselling, and, and you made reference to to the, the, the children being witness to these incidents, mm. um, which is horrifying as a parent, mm. but but as a parliamentarian as well. Um, you know, is is there a remedy to that aside from perhaps the guardian ad litem scenario? But that is much much later in the process. But I mean, is is uh, is there an obstacle for a, a child accessing counselling services or if the mother is yeah. consenting it? Um, or is there some sort of blockage there that, that I'm not picking up? Most professionals, be it a, a, a psychologist or family therapist to whom a child is referred for a variety of reasons, but in this particular context, domestic violence, will seek the consent of both parents for that child to be taken in as a patient of this professional. And very often, and it certainly is my experience, and my experience is also as a family law solicitor, and I am in court on a very regular basis. Um, it is a standard block that can be put by a perpetrator of domestic violence that that person will not consent to a child being seen by a therapist. And the only way around that is to bring a separate application before the court in the context of uh, the Child and Family Relations Act and in the welfare of the child to have the consent of that parent dispensed with so that that procedure can take place. And in your professional experience with both hats on, um, mm -hmm. is, 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 without obviously having to, to go and ask those individual professionals themselves as to why they seek uh, both par parents' consent for the child to access custody, mm -hmm. is there a way around that under current legislation or is there a way around that that you mm -hmm. can foresee? The, the only way to deal with it, if uh, an, an individual is refusing consent and the professional will not take it on because they are then leaving themselves open to charges being brought against them for... Uh, so it's not, it, it, required. it is. That is required. The only option at the moment is an application to court. Okay. okay. And in your experience, how long would that delay the process subject to a successful order being granted for a child to access counselling with only one parent? consent? Well, that brings us into the realm of the operation of the district court, which is the court that the application is most likely to be brought before. And the main court complex for the Dublin area would be Dolphin House, which has four courts sitting per day, five days a week. And if you have an application that wouldn't be regarded as an emergency, and I think an application to dispense with consent would be an emergency application. But given the volume of business, it will now take from an application being made three months to bring a matter before the court and possibly longer. A case can be made if there is an emergency to be dealt with and you certainly will be moved up the list. But it's not by any standard an immediate application okay. to the court because quite simply, Dolphin House can't cope with the level of the volume of business that it has currently. Okay, well, no, I, I thank you very much for that um, information. It's obviously very uh, pertinent in regard to the work of the committee um, in ensuring the children are accessing services. Um, Senator Clifford Lee, I saw you first, and then I think Deputy Mitchell, did I see your hand? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, like my colleague there, I, I was horrified listening to those statistics. But as a, a former family law practitioner myself and in a former life, I'm well used to the, the corridors of Dolphin House and, and what goes on there. Um, so it's not unfamiliar territory. I have a couple of questions. So I'm just going to ask all the questions and then maybe we can have an interaction then after that. You made reference to the refuges and the rate of them um, not being able to facilitate women. I was wondering if there is a, a standard a linking in with the local authorities where those refuges are in an attempt to access the emergency accommodation to, to prevent women and children heading back to the, the family home and to the abuser. Is there somebody there that is equipped to liaise with the local authority? 
My next question is in relation to accessing legal aid and how um, easy that is. Um, and I know in the past there definitely would have been uh, difficulties for women with the standard contribution to, to make that. And I know there's a waiver system, but it was often quite difficult to get the, the waiver. Um, so if you could maybe make comment on, on the actual accessing legal aid and once the legal aid cert is acquired, how easy or not is it to, pr to get a private practitioner to take um, the, 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 the very vulnerable client on at that stage. And then um, the family law courts were uh, referenced there and I suppose were kind of spoiled in one way in Dublin having Dolphin House, a dedicated family law court, but around the country quite often family law sessions are mixed in with other sessions and the, the three month wait that we might have in Dublin could be six months or in other parts of the country. Um, I was wondering if Women's Aid have made any um, submission or made any representations to the Department of Justice in relation to the new family law complex that has been promised and a big hole in the ground is sitting there waiting for development to start and the actual provision of, of proper facilities for uh, cases as these cases. Um, I know that last Christmas a judge was held hostage down in, in uh, Dolphin House and that was a very, very serious incident. The previous Christmas there was a judge actually or an, and a practitioner attacked in Dolphin House and I think coming up to Christmas time um, mm. I think a lot of tensions are heightened and I was just wondering if you have an opinion in relation to the provision of that family law complex. And then finally, um, migrant communities are growing in this country and I was wondering um, how you are accessing those communities with providing translated materials, maybe working with various outreach groups in, in communities and if you could maybe give us some information in relation to that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Some, some very pertinent questions. Um, in terms of refuge, I think the, the certainly we have a free phone a national helpline, so we would be in touch with a lot of the, the refugees around the country. And for a lot of them, the problem is that there is nowhere to be able to send women to. Sometimes in the past, they would have been sent to homeless hostels, to B&Bs, etc. The difficulty there is very often you're talking about somebody who's at very high risk, when they've left a partner, the risk has escalated. The level of risk escalates very significantly. And any domestic violence services that are working with women would be working all the time in terms of having safety at the core, in terms of trying to, to look at safety measures in terms of protecting women and children, etc. But the reality is, unfortunately, that um, in terms of local authorities, sometimes there has been a little bit of difficulty with women trying to access refuge that's outside their county if they're not living in that area. There can be good relationships between some local authorities where there is an openness to that. We have heard of sometimes where women are not, are, are, are not going to be accepted in that, in that local area. We would additionally get calls sometimes from Gardaí who say, I have a woman and three kids in the back of the car, they're at really high risk, I need to find a refuge space, tell me anywhere in the country that I can go to, to to find protection, we will take them there, but there is nowhere. The reality is we know that there is Council of Europe guidelines and we have about a third of the level of refuge space that we need, so that's very significant. If I pick up the migrant one and then, and then Ursula may maybe we'll deal with the others. Um, in terms of migrants, I think definitely they would have significant additional needs really and, and isolation is very much a tactic in terms of domestic violence and if you have a language difficulty, it's much easier and much, you can be much more effective in that isolation process. What we have had for the last number of years is we have on our helpline access within less than a minute to 170 different languages so that at least if somebody comes through to us that they can speak in their own mother tongue, it's a difficult subject to talk about. Um, we sh would share that with Refuge and sometimes we are able to set up calls with the Refuge and with the guards, etc. But it's not a standard um, service that is available, so that is a huge issue. Um, about a significant number of my migrant women would be using our services um, and we would, we would have links into that community and did an awful lot of work over a long period of time with the Immigrant Council etc. So there's, there's a lot of really good connections there. But I think language is certainly one of the, the big ones. And then on our website, in addition to having stuff that is 
is more accessible for people with any sort of difficulties, like we have sign language for deaf women, we have a browse allowed which helps people who have sight issues and, and you can have a lot of stuff text read, and we would have then about eight different languages that all of our information is available in. Thank you. Um, to deal, Senator, with your um, question in relation to legal aid, the reality is that there is a two-tier legal aid system in place in Ireland. There is the criminal legal aid system where there is immediate access and immediate availability and urgency in respect of uh, legal aid representation. The same criteria for whatever reason, and I don't understand why, do, do not... <laughs> that's why there was a significant cut made to the, the, the family law legal aid fees, as I'm sure you're aware, and, and not to the criminal ones. Yeah. I am aware, and that has uh, impacted hugely on women and children. And at this point in time, um, where somebody is eligible for legal aid, but has, is not bringing um, a, a, a front-loaded case, for the want of a better description, in respect of domestic violence, um, but is going to a legal aid board to go through the process of separation uh, or divorce, and maybe from a violent partner, but not doing it by way of a barring order application. In certain um, counties in Ireland, they will wait up to a year for legal representation. With the legal aid boards around Dublin, it is probably somewhere between four and six months for an initial consultation, and then it takes on a certain life of its own after that. There is a private practitioner scheme that is available where there is domestic violence. Um, and that, to a certain degree, works, but there isn't a continuity with it. And one of the things that any practitioner needs dealing with a woman who is fragile, who has been the subject matter of domestic violence, children that have witnessed domestic violence or actually been caught up in the brutality of it themselves, need continuity when it comes to legal representation. Because if you've got to go to different people and try and explain all over again, you're going to give up because there's a level of frustration that comes in uh, in relation to that. And I only heard, and it was confirmed to me the other day, that in certain legal aid cases, a woman cannot, now I, I exclude domestic violence, but to deal with guardianship, to deal with access to children, to deal with maintenance, that a woman will not get more than one legal aid certificate per year. That, that has been I the case for, that, for a number of years, yes, actually. Yes, I find And that. as well as that, um, the, the experience is when oftentimes things are adjourned for interim reports and it's one, you could have maybe 12 court appearances with one mm. legal aid cert. Yes. And, you know, I don't know if members of the committee are aware of what the fees for a legal aid cert is. It's €339. Euro. You know, so I think um, just from my own experience, a lot of practitioners during the recession started taking on legal aid cases. But now, uh, as, as other areas have picked up, they're turning away and, and, like I said, taking the more meatier legal aid cases and leaving perhaps somebody that might have a difficult case, like a domestic violence, that might require a lot of reports over a 12-month period because the, the, P, the fees are so pitiful. And rather than it being kept in-house, it's going out to the private practitioner panel. And <clears throat> to follow on from um, the issue of fees, the constitution was amended so that the voice of the child would be heard in the court. And then there was the Child and Family Relations uh, Act that was um, uh, enacted that provided for uh, reports to be done for the court to facilitate uh, a judge in circumstances where an application is brought before um, a judge, say for, for a barring order, and as night follows day, there will be an application for access. Um, if you look at the volume of work in uh, Dolphin House, there are between 12 and 15 cases listed per court per day. Um, trying to get a proper hearing if you've got complicated matters and trying to get an understanding of the dynamics in a household where there is domestic violence. It takes some time. 
it takes some time to examine uh, a fragile witness and to get the full story of what is going on and also a certain reading between the lines. So a scheme was set up that would provide for reports to be done on children. There was a, a, an arbitrary age division taken and now if children are over the age of 12, by and large they're interviewed by judges. If they're under the age of 12 and from maybe 5 or 6 to 12, a report uh, is done, which is certainly of assistance to the court. But the problem is, at the time, a very, very low fee structure was put in place, mm -hmm. no more than the cuts in legal aid. There are only a handful of these experts that are doing reports for the court. And now, because there is only a handful, uh, the delays on those reports run anything from six months upwards. Yep. And you can just imagine the damage that is being done to a child or children during that period of time. And it gets us back to the problem of bringing in legislation that on the face of it is good, it's strong, it's progressive. But if you haven't got the support behind it and you haven't got the system to enforce it, it comes to naught at the end of the day. We have very, very strong legislation on this issue. We have the voice of the child being heard and it looks great when you read it and it looks so progressive and it ticks every box till you, I hate to use this mm. expression but I will anyway, till you drill down into it and mm. you realise the support systems are not there. And then when it takes so long to get the report there is mm. several trips back to court and yes. there are exhausting trips for the client as well yes. and oftentimes they're so exhausted by, by mm. midway through the process mm. they abandon the process because like you said the fee structure is so low for those expert reports mm. the children are being damaged and then the process yes. gets abandoned at the side as well. Just to answer your question about the, the family law courts, we have made submissions in terms of, of the family law we fed in, in terms of the, the, the infrastructure that should attend to a court like that as well. Uh, one of the developments that we've been pleased to have is that in Dolphin House we have a support and referral service that's a drop-in service because we had been getting calls from women who'd say they were on their way, they were on the, the bus going down to Dolphin House and what, what did they need to know? So at least there's an opportunity and we've been working really well with the court services since then so that the courts can recommend to women to go up to the fourth floor and to to at least if they don't get a barring order they can come back or a safety order and there's some safety planning can be done in relation to that and the support. So we would like to see a whole suite of, of supports and welfare as part of a family law court and the delays in relation to Hammond Lane are deeply disappointing. Um, I know that the, the, it has been voiced in the media again just in the last couple of days but the the infrastructure is really poor and um, I think anybody who's been involved has said it's totally inadequate and there needs to be a commitment to addressing it. And sorry, just in relation to the waiver, the contribution, the legal aid contribution waiver, are you finding uh, clients are having difficulty getting the waiver or has that improved? I think that's improved to some extent, mm -hmm. definitely, and I, I think I think the... the um, Certainly, we would also feed into the Lego board and, and be on, on um, the the panel. The their their escaped my I blanked. Sorry, but we would. But certainly, I think there has been a lot of, of progress in relation to that. It has been done. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Very much for that. Um, thank you. Deputy Mitchell, please. Okay, th thank you, and thank you for your presentation today. I just have a, if just a few brief questions for you. The Minister outlined um, herself in a question to myself back in March that there was nine counties where uh, there's no domestic uh, violence refuge. So I'm just wondering, would you be able to, or would you know the outline of demands? Would you be able to outline the level of demands in any of them counties? Would you be familiar with them? And if you could... If it is the case, could you even uh, let us know here today what, what it's like for a woman to have to travel to another county because the services aren't in her own? So I'll do that one with you first. Thank you, Deputy. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, certainly our experience of it in terms of refuge is that unfortunately for a lot of women they, they will flee and they will go to a refuge or they will look for a refuge and they will be turned away and as I said already any action particularly towards separation tends to escalate the risk so they've immediately escalated the risk. So it's really important that there are services throughout the country. For some women, they will want to go to refuge or they'll want to use services in their own county. But for some women, they will ring and say, I need to be 100 miles away. I'm, I'm in Dublin. I need to be somewhere else. So I think that, that you need an infrastructure, a network, where you can meet all of those needs because it, it's not a case of one size fits all. Yeah. But definitely, our experience are, is there's a lot of women at very high risk. And we are while there has been good progress in terms of the domestic violence legislation, in terms of the responses from the Gardaí, there, there will be for a very long time yet a need for refuge. And we have to admit that that's the case and we have to meet that need. The thing about a refuge is it is a safe space. Very often it is a guarded space with locked doors to protect women and children in those. And that's that, unfortunately, that option has to be there. And an awful lot of women would approach us at different times, including myself, and say they were in Women's Aid Refuge in Harcourt Street donkeys years ago, or even their children, and they can remember the black bags and the sleeping on the floor and whatever, but that their life was, but it really made such a difference. Um, and they may have to go to refuge a number of times. So I think the provision of refuge is inadequate in Ireland and that needs to be addressed. And women, regardless of where they are, because the more isolated they are, the, the higher the level of risk for them. Mm. Well, that was going to bring me on to the next question because, um, like you mentioned, the half of the places were full. And, like, we've seen the Council of Europe we're way, so you would totally agree that we're way below yeah. what's yeah, we've only the recommendations? A we've only a third. So where would you like to see, you know, where's the bar? Well, I think meeting that bar, I mean, I, I think one of the, the things that certainly would give me heart is the fact that we've ratified the Istanbul yeah. Convention. The Istanbul Convention provides a really positive framework for addressing an issue like this. It has four pillars, and they're all really important. The whole thing in terms of prevention, and the work that has to happen, whether that's training, whether that's awareness, that's the work that happens in schools, the issue in terms of protection, the guards, the refuges, the, the part that's very inadequate, and we're doing a sentencing watch to look at this, is the whole issue of prosecution and the penalties that, that there's a lot of men who are repeat offenders. They have left one partner, she has escaped, they've moved on to another partner. They are very dangerous. Mm. Um, and the, the, I think the expertise of the Gardaí has increased to some extent in terms of that, a realisation of that. But that needs to be addressed much more seriously. And then a strong arm about the monitoring to make sure that while the legislation, for example, that we have may look like it's very effective and is extremely welcome, that needs to be more than just the recipe for the cake. You need to be able to eat the cake as well. And unfortunately, uh, while you can see that a lot of this is working, it's not coming, dropping down to the mm. ground. There are women still sleeping in cars. There are women sleeping, you know, couch surfing. There's women who've had to move their kids. We all, and this was before we had a homeless crisis, we were seeing this. So you can imagine how much more compounded the problem is. Just, just in the last bit, the way you, you spoke about uh, access for children. Now, I could only imagine a child who has witnessed domestic violence suddenly being told that you have an access that sometimes they may not want to go mm -hmm. and sometimes the circumstances that they could be dropped off late, picked up late and you know so on and it's traumatic for a child I could imagine but like I wonder if you could just elaborate a bit where you're talking about supervised access and facilities for, yeah. for, for the children. I think one of the things that we would commonly hear is for example a woman may ring today because she has gotten a barring order that she has to provide access on Saturday. Mm. And she's suddenly going, how do I do that in a way that's safe for me and for the children? There was a, um, a, 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 
an evidence-based development with Bernardo's and One Family, where they developed contact centres around Dublin. They weren't specifically for domestic violence, but they were a good model. And I think one of the things we know, uh, there was a lot of feedback we, were, we heard from them, was that the issue of domestic violence was suffering, it was surf, was coming up, sorry. Um, it, it's very significantly among those children and so much so that at times they would have written to the court and said that they were fearful for, in terms of the contact that the father may have with those children. A lot of women are really, really fearful about their, ch their children going on an access visit. They may be fearful in terms of sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, speeding in cars, a number of things. Mm -hmm. So we need a risk, a risk assessment process for children to assess how, how what's the level of risk for them and how safe will they be. Then we need infrastructure that will allow safe contact so that if you have supervised access, you can have buildings that have different entrances and exits so that the, the woman doesn't have to see the <coughs> abusive partner, that the, the child is safe, that the access can happen when that's appropriate, and that the courts at the moment tend to disregard domestic violence and see it as something between the parents rather than understanding that it has a huge impact on children. And we would hear a huge amount from women whose children are really, I mean, a lot of children will go very happily and they will be disappointed if their father doesn't turn up, and that may be the issue. But for an awful lot of children, they are absolutely terrified and they do not want to go. And they have to wait till they're 18 before they can refuse to go. So I think there's a lot of... Um, developments that really need to happen mm -hmm. so that, that there is the risk assessment, that there is the ability to have safe contact and that there is then the supports and the therapy for children in terms of dealing with, with their relationship, which is a very complex relationship for them to deal with. And, and how many contact centres is there? Like, like, could you talk me through? Like, uh, there's, there's, no, no, there's none. There's no supervised access con contacts in Ireland at all. There's there was a pilot which preceded the development of Thusla, which was where you had Bernardo's and one yeah. family, and they had three. Um, and there is a couple of kind of ad hoc arrangements around the country. Um, for example, there used to be a priest in Dublin who, who allowed his community hall be used. Because um, what we would be saying to women, women would sometimes say they have to bring their kids down to the local guard station, even on Christmas Day. They have to go somewhere public. So, because we're trying to, to look at at the, at the whole safety issue and mitigate against the risk for them. So there is, that's what I mean about there needs to be proper mm. infrastructure that actually has policies and buildings and, a, and the backup personnel and people who are trained and who understand this and are able to provide it. And when we're talking about supervised access, would it be social or, you know, what would I, we be looking for? I think for? It's, 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 sorry, it would really be about being able, somebody who's, who understands the dynamics of domestic violence, mm. who's able to see if there's inappropriate things happening, um, is able to feed that back in terms of monitoring what's going on. But I think that they, for an awful lot of women, they would really welcome their child having a relationship with the father. But it's, it's a very difficult situation mm. for them to be in when they're, they're, they don't know if the child will be safe. And some men are very use it as a threat, they may send them photographs and say, we're here, we're at the sea, I might drive the car off the pier and you might never see us, you know, so it's a level of threat. So having somewhere safe, I think people completely underestimate the level mm. of threat that exists in terms of a, a large number of domestic violence cases. And until there's recognition of that, the responses are not going to be developed. And we're dealing with this, this issue, this inadequacy all the time. And just another quick one, sorry for hogging this a bit, so children who would have experienced and from your presentation today, some children have even experienced it themselves, you know, physically. So I'm just wondering, um, if these children were looking for services, are they prioritised in any way or do they join the long list? I mean, to my knowledge, there's one service, the TLC, that Bernardo's runs that's down in Tipperary. Um, I think there, there's a huge lack of a network of, of, of similar supports for children. Um, and I think the other thing that is 
been really difficult, I would sit on the National um, Monitoring Committee on, on Domestic Sexual and Gender-Based Violence, is the resistance that the Department of Education has had to the recognition that abuse happens in the home. We, I have brought it up countless times at the committee. A number of people have brought it up. They would say that you know they, they have had much more of a focus on stranger danger, and I think that's mm. a really important that we have that. But for an awful lot of children, this is something that has pre-existed them being able to talk, to even to be able to expect them to be able to verbalise that. So you have to find a way to support children in an age-appropriate way all the way through their lives. Um, and those supports are sadly very inadequate. I think the NCCA is currently looking at some, some curriculum changes, and I think that that, that does prevent, that presents an opportunity mm. But I think people have to understand that this is something that's happening in a very significant number of homes and it has an impact on children and we need a whole variety of uh, responses so that, that where children are experiencing it they can actually talk to somebody about it rather than the main thing they pick up on is the shame, the stigma, the safety and very few of them are going to talk about it. So they're, they're unlikely to even really talk about the level of threat to themselves. Thanks uh, very much, and uh, I'll move on to Deputy Neville, please. Thank you, and uh, <clears throat> again, a lot of the questions I was going to ask have been asked already, so thank you for your answers on that. Um, I just want to take you uh, through or examine, uh, I think uh, Senator Clifford Lee mentioned in relation to local authorities and local authority housing. Um, in a situation, obviously, where somebody is under pressure or in a domestic violence situation, what are your experiences in interaction with local authorities, particularly people living in local authority houses? Um, that, that's one cohort in trying to get a transfer out of that house or, uh, you know, trying to seek another local authority housing, but obviously is locked in with means tests and everything like that with their partner. Um, and how can one navigate that given the dangers of divulging information. Secondly, then in relation to other people who are in private accommodation, I had an instance of a woman rang me recently who's like 25, 30 years with somebody who wants to go because of a situation. Um, cannot apply for local authority housing because owns half a house. You know, all those implications. Have, you know, this was arising, I found a lot in my own experience. 10, 15 years ago, it was men that were contacting me as a result of marriages breaking up, um, particularly in their 50s, and would have a house with their wife, and, but obviously own half a house and couldn't get on the local authority list. But this is it in a, in a different guise, but the same matters pertain in relation to assets. And has there been any progress in local authorities in relation to these hard cases, or is it still status quo exists? I would like to be able to answer your questions, but to be perfectly honest, the, the experience we've had is where in the past we might have been able to make some sort of progress in supporting women in terms of those issues. The, the reality is with the housing crisis is really, it's been so very difficult. The, under the National Steering Committee on, on, on uh, Violence Against Women, there was regional committee meetings um, and each region, each county would have one. So, for example, in those, the local authorities would have come together to look at the issue of domestic, sexual and gender-based violence. And a lot of them were able to develop a lot of contacts and have reciprocal arrangements that did help. And also it meant that the issue of domestic violence was on their agenda much more so. The, those committees have since ceased. They haven't been in, in situ now for well, a number of years. Can I ask, can I interject, what was the reason why they ceased? It was... A, a, a decision really under the, the by the Department of Justice that, that they would keep the National Monitoring Committee um, and the regional committee meetings then ceased. They were supported um, through the uh, HSE as far as I remember. And the, the other thing is that, that it's been very, that there was a lot of work that was done by the National Steering Committee, a lot of guidelines that were fed in by Safe Ireland by SUNIS, by ourselves, and a whole range of domestic violence services. But the difficulty was in terms of trying to implement them. The Department of the Environment was saying to us that really, they, you know, the whole concept of subsidiarity meant that you had to recognize the, the decision-making process at a local level. So it tended to get very stuck. 
and our experience, as I've said, is it, is it was an area where about half of our time was being sent in, spent in courts. There was a, equally the same amount of time was really been spent in, in supporting women in terms of housing options. Um, but that, because of the housing crisis, has really fallen away because we haven't been able to have any impact in that sector. There's just not enough housing options. I understand that, but in relation to the bureaucracies, I'm speaking about the actual process of getting on the housing list, because obviously if somebody gets on the housing list, they can get HAP if they go into private rented accommodation, yeah. if they're lucky yeah. to get that. Yeah. But what you're saying is those bottlenecks still exist, or yeah. there has been no progress yeah. even on that, yeah. and that now these regional assemblies have ceased to... They have for a number of years, yeah. ...exist. Okay. Uh, just, uh, I think this is more of, of, of your own opinion. Given what you're aware of in relation to this, what in your opinion would be out there that are, you're not aware of? You know, oftentimes when you say things are stigmatised, brushed under the carpet, is there any, again it can be difficult to answer, but is there any kind of perception of what the real figure is of people that are going through challenging situations that haven't come forward? Is there any anecdotal evidence on that? Uh, well, I mean, uh, there's two things. One is I think the, the, the research that I referenced, the, the EU FRA, that was the last piece of a big research that was done on violence against women, and it was it was face-to-face -face interviews in each country, and you can pull that data out. So that gives us some sort of sense of what the figures are. The our anecdotally is, I suppose, people would often ask me, do I think the level of domestic violence is increasing? What I would see, certainly in terms of, of the demand on our services, is when we get a high level of promotion, there's, a, there's an increase. So I think when people know that there's somewhere where they can go. Okay. For example, when Clodagh Hall was murdered, we had a 48% spike in the number of calls we had in the following weeks in relation to that. So that, that there, there's a correlation between an awareness of that there's help there and people seeking that. And to me, what that's saying is there's obviously a much bigger need, but we have very poor data in terms of, of getting some sort of an assessment of what is the level of data. We did research ourselves as an organisation which has showed that one in five women are experiencing domestic violence at some point in their life. No other research has really shifted that. Okay. In 2005, you had the Crime Council that severe abuse was about one in seven. So we still haven't really got the measure. And I think with the Istanbul Convention, one of the things is the need to have good data, because until you have good data, you cannot actually have good solutions. So there is a huge need for research. Yeah. And has there been much research into the whys this take place, the underlying conditions that drive someone either to do or carry out this act, or for someone to get involved with somebody that would or may carry out this act? I think that most of the research has been more about quantifying it and okay. about the impact then. So we're just scratching the surface, really? It's, it is, yeah, it is, it is, yeah. I mean, I think um, there would be different views and some of them would be quite contentious about the whys. Yeah. But I think uh, in terms of the, even trying to get that very basic baseline to know what the figures are and... Um, I think one of the things that's most encouraging really is that there have been a significant number of women now who have come forward and have talked about their own experience. Okay, I think good. that is a catalyst now for a move good. to talk about things more. And I think women, that, that kind of shame threshold is being broken a, a, a bit and I think that will help. But I think the basic thing is, you know, we need good data. We, the, the, we know, for example, that the data the Gardaí were able to provide is not robust enough. It has The CSO has been reluctant to even carry some of their figures. Um, and we would know that, that the, 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 the levels of domestic violence are not being accurately recorded anywhere in the system. So I think it's, it's the first thing to do is to measure mm -hmm. the extent of it. Okay. Like I said, I, my questions are completely sensitive towards people in this situation. I'm just trying to of, scratch of the surface of and get course. behind it, you yeah. know, to understand yeah. it a lot better. But thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Deputy Neville. Any other members wish to contribute? Okay. Uh, thank you very much um, to our guests, uh, Ms. Martin and Ms. Regan. Um, uh, I really do appreciate you coming before the committee. Um, and answering questions in such a comprehensive way. Uh, we'll suspend for a few moments to allow time for our uh, next session to commence. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, again, welcome uh, members and also viewers who may be watching our proceedings on Oireachtas TV and to the public session of the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Children and Youth Affairs. Our second session this afternoon is the Children's Rights Alliance, uh, their uh, report card 2019. And on behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome Ms Tanya Ward, Chief Executive, and Ms Adele Quinn, uh, Legal Research and Public Policy Manager, both of the Children's Rights Alliance. You're very welcome this afternoon and thank you for coming. Before we commence, in accordance with the procedure, I'm required to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect to their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter uh, to these proceedings to be given. And you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons, or entity by name or in a way to make him, her, or it identifiable. Members are reminded of the long standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise, nor make charges against a person outside the House or an official either by name in a way to make him, her, or it identifiable. And may I please remind members and witnesses to turn off your mobile phone or put them into flight mode as they will interfere with the sound system, which makes it difficult for parliamentary reporters to report the meeting. Uh, I also wish to advise you that any submission or opening statements you, have to make, you make to the committee will be published on the committee's website after this meeting. After your presentation, uh, there will be questions for the members of the committee. And I will now call on Ms Ward and Ms Quinn to make your opening statement, please. Thanks to the committee for the opportunity to present the results of our annual report card. Um, so before I start, I just want to talk a little bit about the Children's Rights Alliance. Uh, we're a membership body, we're nearly 25 years old, and we're an umbrella organisation for organisations campaigning for children and young people in Ireland. And the report card is one of our flagship projects, it's an annual project, and what we do with that report is we track how the government is delivering on its promises to children in the programme for government. So these aren't promises that we would make up ourselves. This is what the government itself and the programme for government that it's committed. Um, one of the things I suppose that's significant about it is while we research and write the report in the Children's Rights Alliance, it's actually an independent panel that grades the report card every year and that's chaired by Judge Catherine McGuinness and a range of different experts. And that's really important for us because we are very close to the issues and the panel, uh, I suppose, try to be as neutral as possible in grading the report card. So in terms of this year's report card, obviously we're three years into the current programme for government um, and the government got a C grade, which is, I suppose, the highest grade to date for this programme for government. And that's because in, all, in nearly every area you actually see progress on the commitments that the government has made. Now, in some of the high points in, in the report card, the government gets an A grade for the LGBTI plus strategy. Um, and if you look at the detail of that strategy, it's probably one of the biggest and most effective consultations ever taken, undertaken by the Department of Children and Youth Affairs for a youth initiative. And what's also very significant about it is that the measures in the strategy will deal with some of the key problems that we know LGBTI children are facing. So even in that consultation itself, what we heard was a lot of young people are suffering from bullying in the school place, uh, they're being stereotyped, a lot are self-harming as well. So even though we've had a high point with marriage equality, things have not changed sufficiently for LGBT plus I young people in schools and hopefully this strategy will get us there. Another high point, I suppose, is in relation to child poverty. And the reason I say that is last year, actually, we had the most progressive budget to date since before the recession um, when it comes to child poverty. And I say that because, um, particularly from this, the Department of Social Protection, the budget include, included a range of different measures that will, make it, will have an impact for children. We know we have over 100,000 children living in consistent poverty. That number grew. Uh, exponentially at different points during the recession. Uh, we had a decrease just in December, 25,000 children uh, were lifted out of consistent poverty. And the kind of measures that you saw in the budget were related to um, older children who were more likely to be experiencing poverty. There was an extra five euros on welfare payments 
for those children, extra funding for school meals programme, and including a hot school meals programme being piloted. That's really important because that's one of the answers if we're dealing with child poverty in Ireland. There was also the possibility of lone parents being able to earn more every week um, uh, before losing their benefits as well. So these kind of very targeted measures will make a big difference to families, but obviously we're only part of the way there and we need sustained investment and programmes if we are going to change the dial when it comes to child poverty. Another area I just want to name as a high point was in relation to childcare. And the reason I say that is that last year, last year about 72,000 families got to benefit from a childcare subsidy. That's, that was pretty significant in our, in our history. But of course, you will know as a committee, we are way behind when it comes to childcare. Con other countries were developing their national childcare systems back in the 1940s and 50s. So we are years behind. What is significant about last year is the fact that 574 million was secured to provide a national uh, childcare scheme subsidy. Now there's issues with will that scheme be wide enough for people living in poverty uh, and I can talk to the committee in more detail in relation to that but I think it's, it's a milestone in the development of, of our system. Just bringing to some final points then, uh, direct provision. Uh, we actually saw some very significant developments in the last year when it comes for children living in direct provision. Um, Particularly, the direct provision payment that children receive on a weekly basis was increased from 2110 to 2980. Uh, that's very significant because up for about 15 years, children in direct provision were only receiving 960 per week. The other thing that's very important is national standards for refugee accommodation have been developed. They have yet to be published, and to be honest, unless there are independent inspections, those standards won't be meaningful. They won't result in the change that we need to see happen in that area. So in terms of the low points, you will see in the report card the government gets an F when it comes to child homelessness. And that's not to recognise there is a lot happening across the board. We know there's over 60 million going into homeless services. We know there's 1 billion going into HAP payments, so to help families try and stay in rented accommodation. But the reality is, between 2017 and 2018, there was an extra 500 children in homeless accommodation. So these measures have not been sufficient to turn the tide when it comes to child homelessness and we know that about 12% uh, of children in homeless accommodation are there now for two years or more. So we're very concerned about the impact of institutionalisation on these children, the impact on their education and the impact on their welfare. And I suppose lastly I just wanted to highlight the area of travellers. Um, I mean it has to be to my shame, I'm Chief Executive of the Children's Rights Alliance for seven years now, but what we're seeing for traveller children is a very serious deterioration in their situation, particularly when it comes to accommodation. We know that 40% of traveller children are living in overcrowded accommodation. So that means for them, very difficult to live in that kind of situation. It's a very stressful situation. They don't have access enough oftentimes to sanitation. So you, talk, you hear parents talking about bringing children out during the night to wee during the night. Um, and you also hear that despite all of that, National, central government is making money available to invest in traveller accommodation, but it's not being spent. And I think that's one of the major scandals when it comes to travellers. There are the, some of the main points, but happy to answer any questions for the committee. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Ms Ward. And I, I, just before I let Senator Freeman in, because I know um, the time is against her, I, and I'll be very quick, and I yeah. just have a couple of observations yeah. to make and perhaps um, seek your, your, your views. Um, and lest I be accused of being partly political, a C plus is not good enough yeah. for this state. Yeah. Um, an F in relation to homelessness is disgraceful. Mm -hmm. And uh, our national legacy of the treatment, regardless of what we have done in relation to ethnicity, and I worked on, as a member of the Justice Committee in the last all, yeah. uh, I worked on that extensively with the, the now Minister, then Chairman, David Stanton, um, our, our collective um, failure to, to, to provide traveller accommodations across the state is nothing short of a disgrace. So all of those matters out and open <coughs> straight away. But one of the things that I find most frustrating, and you've hit the nail on the head starting out by um, making the, the very clear and unambiguous statement that those are, um, in... Um, consistent levels of poverty children has reduced dramatically in, in the recent past um, and yet on every occasion when we have this conversation especially 
in Dáil and Seanad Éireann, the complete opposite information is being presented as fact. Um, and, I, and I do find it incredibly frustrating uh, that this narrative is being created um, in the political world in this country, um, that we as a state and all of its institutions, whether they be state-sponsored or, or NGOs, um, are failing in their duties or responsibilities in relation to, to child um, uh, consistent levels of poverty or those at risk of, of, of poverty. Um, and the opposite is true. And, and that is something that I just want to put on the record. But one of the questions I have in relation to you, and it actually does relate to travellers, and, I, and I'm pleased that you raised it, because when I was going through all of your, um, your submissions yesterday, um, it was the one that jumped out at me, having worked on the Justice Committee in the last all. Um, how do we change the attitude of our local authorities and, it, and their councillors, particularly in the context of a local election in two weeks? How do we change that attitude? Mm -hmm. from from members um, on, on sound reasons refusing to permit local authorities to expend monies on sites that are down backcountry lanes with absolutely no services whatsoever yeah. um, to uh, out and out just objections for the sake of it. How do we um, as a state grasp this contentious nettle and actually provide the services that we should be providing as a state to an ethnically recognised part of our society and, and, and ensure that the, 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 the area that we have particular interest, the children of traveller families up and down the state, um, find themselves in deplorable conditions. Um, and are there any um, words of advice that you might have to offer the committee? Okay. Um, I, I really welcome the question on, on, on traveller children. Uh, I, I think there's, an, uh, there's a multiplicity of different things that we need to do. I think one of the core things that talking to travellers uh, about their everyday experience is the discrimination and interpersonal racism that they experience, which I think goes on to influence the, the actions of the council members um, and councils in deciding what to do around accommodation issues. One of the things that was really striking when we went to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child um, and Pave Point attended uh, with us and what they, what was really shocking to hear them present to the committee was the, the position where travellers were, how they feel at that, and it was after the Carrick Mines fire and they couldn't get their, travellers couldn't get their head around the lack of compassion for them after the biggest fire in the history of the state since the Stardust. Um, and it was really symptomatic of something very deeper in Irish society that we, we have yet to address, I, I believe. Um, so I think we need to do more work on valuing travellers in Irish society, valuing their culture and their identity, and addressing the discrimination that happens for travellers on an everyday basis. Because consistently they will tell you, we, we, I have to hide my traveller identity in the workplace because I'm unlikely to hold on to my job. Um, uh, we, 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 we had Kathleen speak at uh, the launch of a report card and she talked about her, her experience, her first job she got after school was once they found out she was a traveller, suddenly things got much more difficult and effectively she was constructively dismissed in the workplace. And I do think, uh, you know, if you look at what happened to the Equality Authority around the same time and the, the reduction in funding, it just so happens that discrimination for travellers increases and we, we don't address it. So I think there's a big piece there that we need to address. Obviously, we have a Human Rights and Equality Commission and has a very important role here in terms of addressing discrimination. When it comes to councillors there and the way the councils are operating, we may need to look at sanctions um, uh, and something more forthright like that to actually make sure they make the decisions to provide accommodation. Because I know in one particular council, €2 million Euros was sent back and has been successively, and it has... the this particular council area has a very big traveller population. So something has to be done at the national level to address this crisis because we know travellers are ending up in homeless accommodation. That's what Focus Ireland are saying. They have bigger families. They're finding it more difficult to find homes and accommodation. So I think if we take a more forthright approach um, and we take a twinned approach, we look at the traveller identity 
we look at addressing discrimination uh, and I think we have to get to traveller children themselves. They don't value themselves uh, at this point in time. Morale is very low. They feel very low. We had a consultation with, with children from around the country and traveller children took part in it. Um, there were two children who said, we've never discri experienced discrimination, but what they did say to us, I have no hope for my future. We have to change that. Every traveller child in the country should have hope for their future. Um, yeah, if I can add, um, there's also a national, um, uh, the Traveller Accommodation es Expert Group was established last, um, at the, towards the end of last year, last October. So they were due to report within the next six months and set out priorities in this area. So I mean, that, that time would be around now. And so we'd be expecting that to be published soon. And then I mean, to look at priority, what the recommendations are that are coming from that group specifically, and then look at prioritising those and implementing them. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Sorry to take your time. Fine, Senator um, thank Freeman, you very please. much. Thank, thank you, you for, for, for your report. Um, and one of my questions is following the chairs, which is, I, I don't know if I'm understanding this right, it's to do with the, with the travellers. First of all, I remember um, we invited Pave Point to one of our Eroptus meetings for, for mental health. Um, and I mean, you, you know, one of the figures that sticks out all the time for me that 90% of travelling men will not reach the age of 60. And that just, just even that alone is, is, is horrifying. But, uh, so a couple of questions. Number one, um, when you say that the money isn't being spent, even though it's been allocated, are we talking about it's the county council, it's the councils who are refusing to spend it? Well, I don't get that, first of all. I don't, it's sent back. So, to me, the answer of my local authority. Uh, just, I, I can't, I can't get my head around that. Yeah. So, to me, the solution is is to involve people from the travelling community into government, to be on the county councils, or to be to be running for elect. And I don't know. And that's the question: is is, is that happening at all? Um, so that, that was that part. So ha, I can't understand how the money has been sent back. The second question I want to ask you, which of course is my one trick pony um, question, and that is about the mental health. Have you, did you do any findings on mental health for children, about the services in particular? Because when you said that the government has scored a C, I am deeply surprised, deeply surprised. Uh, so I would be really, um, and when I say deeply surprised, not pleasantly, but I'm just, I don't believe, see, I would have put it all down as a nap, to be perfectly honest. Uh, so I would, be, I, I would be interested to hear what your, your, your findings on that were, please. So I suppose in, in, in relation to uh, the, the traveller situation, I, I think representation is very important actually at different levels and I'm not aware of any travellers who are standing for election at the moment but obviously there are other black and ethnic minority people coming forward. What is very positive to see is the traveller organisations are doing a lot of leadership development at the moment. So you'll see great people starting to come up through with education, with PhDs, who are going to lead into the future. And there's been excellent work done by travellers themselves. Um, and I think mobilisation of the traveller community themselves, speaking for themselves, organising themselves and leading is fundamental in terms of addressing the, kind of the key issues. Um, I mean, it is shocking when you hear in terms the accommodation point of view that there is money there and it's available and it's not being spent because that's what we always complain about there's no money being made available by central government um, so I do think we need something more radical if we're going to change the figures and because the state is just paying for it another way they're paying for it because travelers are in homeless accommodation then um, and, and, and that we're paying for it in terms of health services and you're right I mean the low infant mortality rates, the death rates, uh, high death rate uh, for adult men, the low employment rates, it all smacks of deep levels of deprivation mm -hmm. that we as a society have let happen over a long period of time. And the other thing I think, I don't know if people realise, is like half of the traveller population are children and young people under the age of 18. It's, a, it's, a, it's an extraordinary opportunity actually, in terms of early intervention and trying to address the deep levels of discrimination and deprivation. 
Um, in terms of mental health, I was going to pass on to my colleague Adele. Uh, so yes, so from the mental health point, um, side of things, um, the, the, the government were awarded a D minus um, this year, and it's consistently been over the, pro the course of the program for government, so the, in the, up to the third year now, the, one of the lowest grades that they've been given. Um, and so that's largely due to the, the, the review of vision for change not yet being completed, um, the lack of 24 seven um, access to services, and that's something that comes through to um, our, uh, our, our own services line, or we've an information line, and it's something that consistently comes through and that, that people are ringing up saying, you know, what am I going to do for my, for my child on a Friday evening, say, um, you know, when, they're, when they have a child that needs access to services. Um, and then obviously waiting lists, you know, that's another area that's uh, access to, you know, children and young people are waiting long periods. So I think around 20% of children and young people um, last year uh, waited over a year for access to CAMS. Um, and also, uh, there are also waiting lists around the community psychology services as well. Um, so, like, we, you know, absolutely agree with you. There are a number of consistently being D minus for how many years? It was a D minus in the first year, so in 2016, a D plus, I think, in the, um, 2017, and then, uh, sorry, I'm wrong, uh, 2017 it was a D minus, D plus, and then D minus again, so it's gone slightly up, but back down again this year. But it's always been one of the lowest ones, and that's been yeah. something that the, 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 our independent panel of experts who, who award the grades um, on report card, like, you know, it's something that really, they really feel passionately about. Mm. Yeah. I'm actually, I have to leave shortly because I'm going to actually to an information meeting presented by Minister um, Jim Daly for Mental Health, and I will be saying... You got a D minus. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll you. be speaking on your behalf. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Senator Freeman. Thank you, Deputy Neville, Neville, please. Yes. Just, sorry, your microphone. Just a quick question. You mentioned there in relation to waiting lists. Are there different waiting lists in different parts of the country? See, you know, you have nine CHOs. Are there different waiting lists? Or is it kind of a uniform across the board? Or have you stats on that? And secondly, in relation to accommodation or, or any of the issues pertaining, are there some areas performing better than others? You know, are you seeing more problems in, in kind of different sectors of the country? Yeah. Um, do you want to go and I have something to say on that as well? Oh, yeah. right, okay. Yeah, but, but, yeah keep say something, I'll yeah. pass on to you. Um, in terms of the waiting list, I'll let, I'll, let, I'll let Adele take the detail on that. But something I did want to say is what we do know in terms of the availability of uh, community psychologists and CAM services, we know there's a direct link to school attendance. So in areas where, because one of the things to go when a child is uh, a young person is suffering emotionally and mentally and they can't get the support that they need, sometimes they find it very hard to go to school and to stay in school. And it can be, it can be the exam is the reason for the stress. Uh, but Usually there's been a long period. By the time you need to go to CAMS, there's usually been a long period, but, but, uh, what, and it's why you need the CAM service. So we know that already at the moment. So if you look at somewhere like Wexford, where there has been a gap in service provision, um, school attendance will be lower. And we, we, we know that from talking to different actors in, in the field. Uh, and we think it's something that absolutely has to be addressed because there is an issue with school attendance. You address the mental health needs of those children and young people and you will get, you'll get better school attendance. On the waiting list, and we don't have the detail of where in the country, but certainly it's inconsistent across the country. Okay, the, level of the waiting okay, list. This is an important that, point, yeah. Yeah, and that's largely down to the availability or the lack of availability of the staff, of clinicians to carry out those services. So they're having trouble getting you know, the staff to, to apply for jobs. Um, and I think it is, you know, does have something to do with the level of pay involved and the locations as well. Um, so that's. That's what we've been hearing from the, the HSC mental, mental Health Service that's as what part of our research. Is, that's what they have communicated back to you from yeah. the HSE? Yeah. 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 yeah, because I can give you some other extra information. The recruitment model of the HSE is not helping. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. it's not local source, it's yeah. national source to a centralised system. Right. Yeah. So that might be something to uh, research. It would be interesting to get some, yeah. from your own perspective, yeah. mm -hmm. to get that research and bring it back to the table. Yeah. Because that's what I found from my research is that and from speaking to the likes of Tusla and all these others, mm -hmm. is that there's no local, there's a use of panels, and there's no local recruitment drive, or even right, regional yeah. recruitment drive, yeah. that can help that. That's why I asked the questions around the CHOs, because, I mean, there's been 114 assistant psychologists put into community health care, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, so there's going to be disparaging results as well there. But thanks for your time, and it might be something for yourselves just to communicate yeah, back absolutely. to the HSE when you yeah. speak to them, yeah. to yeah. push back on as well. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Deputy Neville. Uh, Deputy Mitchell. Yeah, thanks for coming in. J just briefly, I'm just 
two points I want to touch on. Okay, first would be child homelessness. Now, I, I don't think there's nobody that will disagree here in the room. We know what needs to be done, but unfortunately, it's not happening quick enough. We need social and affordable houses, housing. But I just want to ask you, in the meantime, for a child who's living day to day in a home, what can we be doing to make that better for that child? And you could talk us through about the impacts. Like, we've heard so much about emotional, we're hearing about um, health, their food, but is there anything that we can be doing, you know, from, from school level, from the minute the child gets into school to coming home, that we can help that child? There's obviously quite a lot we could be doing to actually address the situation at the moment for those 3,824 children who are in, in homeless accommodation. Um, one thing that's striking about our housing laws and policies is that they were developed at a time when the main group of people availing of homeless services were, were men with addiction issues, rough sleepers, etc. Given that children make up such a significant cohort now of the homeless population, it's something that we need to look mm. at. And if we oblige decision makers to make decisions in the best interests of children, it would mean when they develop accommodation solutions that they have to think about the child. One of the things we hear from our members is that there's a big variation in the stock that's used in homeless services. So you might get one family hub with great um, facilities for families, great play facilities, and you might get another that doesn't have sufficient facilities at all. Um, and that would be very significant from the early years providers are seeing that. They see children sometimes that don't have play facilities, children that don't have um, a space to crawl. Um, and the big concern there for very young children is they're going to miss all their developmental milestones. So when they arrive at school, they're going to be way, ahead, uh, way behind all the other children as well. When it comes to, let's say, the educational welfare, the emotional welfare of young people going through this, what was very striking from the Ombudsman for Children's consultation was the fact that children themselves said, didn't see family hubs as the solution uh, to, to, uh, to, to homelessness. And obviously what they want is they want a home as soon as possible. They want security because it's such a destabilising experience. Something we've called for in report card um, and our No Child 2020 campaign is a time limit on the use of homeless accommodation. That if you minimise it to six months, you could try and minimise the impact of institutionalisation because I think that's what you're seeing from children, uh, particularly in that consultation from the Ombudsman and for children and in the research that we commissioned last year on, on, on homelessness. So children um, not, not being able to go down to the family room on their own, 14-year-olds not having the possibility to go down to the family room on their own, children having to come in and sign in, saying, I feel like I'm in a prison because I have to sign in every day, um, uh, children being told what to do by other adults other than, than their parents, and that's what institutionalisation starts to feel like. Um, the other piece that I think from an educational point of view, which we uncovered in, in research we published last year, was that actually between your DESH school and your non-DESH school, there is a distinction. The DESH school has more flexibility. Um, they've got breakfast clubs. They have a little bit of funding to provide some extra supports mm -hmm. to children going through this. Um, but schools in the main are doing the best they can and doing a very good job. Um, what the non-desk schools told us was they had no flexible budgets to do anything. So if a child arrives in a dirty school uniform, they have no money there. Teachers are spending their own money trying to buy clothes for a child. Uh, they're spending their own money to feed children. Um, and what the school said they would need, and they just wanted for a temporary period, is a homeschool liaison officer or a teacher to support the families. Because sometimes principals were saying they were the ones ringing up Focus Ireland or accommodation providers or hotels trying to get a family into accommodation, uh, whereas a homeschool liaison officer could do that kind of work supporting families as well. And I think from knowing that the, the findings of the research is saying their emotional well-being is being affected. Um, they sit, the teachers are saying it's happening over a period of time. And when that starts happening, when children start missing school, um, they, when they, they're ashamed of describing the situation they're in in terms of homelessness, they have to leave early, they can't hang out with their friends after school, and what you have is, you know, they start losing their motivation for school, and they're more vulnerable to dropping out. Um, and that's where we need, I suppose, the school completion programme. We've mm. had a lot of dealings with them, really tracking those children, making sure we can keep them in school, but it's really supporting the school to support their well-being, mm. giving them that kind of emotional
emotional toolkit, you know, to mind their own mental health and their emotions, um, and giving the schools the resources uh, to do the best job. Okay, that they can. can I just ask you a question on the school completions program? Have you found yourself that it's not working to the best of its capacity that it did previous when it was within the Department of Education? Because now it's back in, isn't it, two slits in children and youth players? So have you, have you seen a, a decline in services? No, not, necessarily, not, ne not necessarily, but what we would be aware of is that they don't have sufficient numbers of education welfare officers, officers. to actually do the job. So they're, they're responding to all the reports, but they need more education welfare officers because the, they, they need to be able to chase non-attendance of mm -hmm. children in schools. And if you look at Carol Coulter's reports documenting children in the childcare courts, you know, a significant number of children won won't have been in school. So you wonder what happened from an educational point of view. If you look at the stats for children in Oberstown, you'll find that a significant number weren't in school. So how were they not in school? How are measures not being taken in relation and, and, and mm -hmm. to address that? So I think that's something uh, at the very least that needs to be addressed. Thank you, Deputy Mitchell. Go, go ahead, on the last note, um, you touched on it there about the Guardian Enlightenment Service. We were just talking about uh, beforehand about it. it's going to be published soon. So I just want to ask you, um, would you have any proposals? I've read your submissions and I'll just have it out here. Any proposals to that, with that regard? And um, do you think it's important that the service has got an independent identity? And is there anything that you would like to see that would enhance the Guardian Enlightenment Service. Yeah, I mean, um, we, we are expecting new, uh, the, the new draft legislation any time now. Um, um, and we've, we've made a number of submissions on it you know, to, to yourselves um, and to the department. Um, we, like, what we've, we've, uh, we've heard that there's a, a, a consultation with children and young people going on, or that, you know, that it's, at least it's, it's, um, it's started. So uh, that's something that we would have called for um, over the last couple of years on it. So children who have experience of it um, and, and hopefully to enhance the legislation. Um, absolutely, we welcome the, you know, the, the, the latest iteration of the bill has um, the, the, the new executive office under the Department of Children and Youth Affairs as opposed to TUSLA. So we absolutely welcome that. And that's something that we would have called for. Um, certainly around the status of the GAL, that's something that's that's the key outstanding issue for us around, you know, the, under the the, the, um, the the latest iteration of the bill, the gal would be um, a, a witness as opposed to a party, um, and that does undermine the role that they currently has. It dilutes the powers that they currently have and the way that they are able to represent children. So, for example, around the cross examination, just you know, that's a kind of a, a, um, one of the main areas where at the moment, um, you know, it's kind of evolved over convention over years that a gal would be able to cross through a lawyer would be able to cross examine. Tusla, for example, um, on decisions taken, and that you know that they'd be severely limited in their ability to cross-examine, and we believe that that you know fundamentally impact the role that the gal plays, um, and and the way that children's voices are heard, and um, before in, in proceedings that you know have a huge impact on their lives. And that's, that's very common that anybody that we're speaking to, that's what they're raising, that they believe that it's watering down the service as such because it is an invaluable service. As you said, it's representing children's voices, but. Um, I'm just wondering, do you think the role itself needs to be enhanced? You know, like, like when we look at figures from different counties, a point to the gal quicker, you know? So is there anything around that that you'd like to see happening that? Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's you know, the, what we're hearing from the department is that the, the intention behind the legislation is that gals would be appointed. It would be the norm to have a gal appointed. Mm. But it, is up, it would be up to a judge, judge. to decide that. Um, and what we're seeing at the moment is that there's a real variance across the country. So in Louth, I think there's around 75% or 80% of, of cases of gals appointed, whereas in Galway it's down to 13. Um, and what we, you know, what really you'd need for, for the judges to, you know, to to, to a more consistent level mm. of, uh, applied across the country, or so through, through across the courthouses across the country, to ensure that gals are appointed. You know, so that the, the judges have to give reasons if they're not appointing one, to. and that you know is something that hopefully would help in that area. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Senator Warfield, please. Thank you very much. Um, I was at the launch, and uh, I think it's a really, really important indicator, and just really important for our work to see where the state is at. I just have one question just around whether the department engaged with you before and after and what, what that engagement looks like. Do they contest anything or what, what's that engagement like? 
I mean, it's actually very positive. Um, we, we find it very, the, the engagement we have with government departments when we're developing the report card to be very open and transparent. Mm -hmm. um, and so we would submit questions to the different government departments and try to get behind some of the rationale for some of the initiatives that might not be happening or to try to understand what the delays are. Um, and we find generally most government departments are actually very open to recommendations and, and, and ideas yeah. um, when it comes to the different initiatives. Adele, Adele has direct, manages all these relationships, so she can give you a direct experience of it. Yeah, um, so, so we, we um, engage really um, thoroughly with uh, with with. Um, uh, almost, uh, well, I think about seven departments um, and a number of agencies and bodies within those departments. So it's very heavy, um, the level of engagement, including the Department of Children and Youth Affairs. Um, we find that um, they're very keen to um, highlight um, the work that they've done. So, in, in, you know, uh, so we find that they t tend to, for the most part, yep. uh, engage pretty well um, and, uh, and, and provide us with the data that we need, and that's, that's you know that's really helpful. We we kind of know every year that um, you know when it comes to a report card, we can find out information that we need and maybe help our members with that as well if they're looking for a particular piece of information. So so yeah, I mean you know we do find that it is a positive yeah. engagement yeah. Um, and something I suppose that we've built up over yeah. years um, you know as well and, and, tr and work ac actively work to, to you know to maintain a positive relationship. We have Minister Zabon in next week on the for an update on the LGBTI strategy. It's only a two-year strategy, so we're about a year in. Um, so there, I, I haven't seen many actions completed. Um, but that said, they could be teeing up everything for the second year, but um, certainly around relationships, sexuality education, bullying in schools, gender recognition, um, and the legal relationship between LGBTI, young people, LGBTI parents and their young people um, and their children. Uh, will all be stuff that uh, will come up, but I think it's a, it's, I think it's a fitting grade given the publication of the strategy. Anyway, um, I'd love to stay on the various bits, but I, I think we'd be going around in circles if we do. I just want to say, just to commend the work that you've done. Thank you. May I just come in just quickly? Just of course. A, uh, sorry, ahead. I remember the last time we spoke, we um, the free travel was given for children, the school terms. Has that progress entered the summer time? Has anything changed from that? You know, like considering that children are going to be breaking up from school now in a few months and that left sitting in hotel rooms and stuff. Did that progress? It, it, it's my understanding that that hasn't progressed. That's still an issue that needs to be addressed. addressed. Um, and the administration of the travel scheme, I think, by people within the homeless services are finding administration very taxing as well. So I think that could make a huge difference for families yeah. in terms of trying to reduce that level of institutionalisation and, and alienation, if, if that could be addressed by the committee. It's, um, the was there costs associated with that, Deputy? Yeah, sure. Yes, it was. It was um, the free travel, remember, for children getting to school. And they had, remember, campaigned vigorously last year that the children should be given, not just at school time, you know, over the scum, school, uh, summer period, to allow families to take their children out. Yeah. I've only talked in eight weeks. Yeah. So I think maybe it's something that we can, when we have the minister, we can raise again. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. We, it, it, we might take it upon ourselves to, do, yeah. to um, also get in contact with um, the Department of Transport. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as well. In relation to the Going issue. Forward. So. It would seem one of those costs that has a net benefit to the state mm. um, in the long run. Uh, so we need to determine what the cost is first, mm. of course. But, uh, but yeah, thank you for that. Go ahead, please, Ms. Ward. One thing that we are hearing from our member organisations is that sometimes they are finding it difficult to identify where the hubs are, where the services are, to be able to provide services. So, particularly, let's say, within the early years area or sometimes in the family support area. So, it might be that a piece of work needs to be done to link the services together. So, they're aware there's some data sharing agreements put in place that are obviously GGB or compliant to make them aware so they can get those services mm. in because the key is is getting children out 
uh, particularly of those facilities, particularly if they're inappropriate in any way, and trying to give them some sense of normality. What was really striking from the homeworks research we published that, uh, last year, which looked at children experiencing homelessness, was education facilities, so creches, Montessori's, primary schools, secondary schools, are kind of a, a place of solace um, for children. That's the only sense of normality that they have. So the best engagement that they have, the best support that those institutions are given, uh, the better outcomes for children. Mm. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Um, that concludes our, our um, discussion. I'd like to thank you both, um, Ms. Ward and Ms. Quinn, for coming in and, and answering our questions uh, so comprehensively. Uh, and on behalf of the committee, I would like to thank you uh, for taking the time to, to attend. And the Joint Committee is adjourned until 9 a.m. on Wednesday, the 15th of May, when the committee will meet with the Minister for Children and Youth Affairs to receive an update on the LGBTI plus youth strategy.